Yeah. 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 No, it's all on. So we start. Hello. Hello and welcome. So I'm very happy and honored to be chairing this lecture. Uh, two reasons to first, of course, the topic is very relevant, important, urgent. Uh, the question of uh, um, is our knowledge system really responding to the urgent uh, development challenges uh, captured more or less well by the development goals, but in general, the question about the, how much the knowledge systems or the knowledge systems we have are really uh, responding to the development challenges. Uh, be a very important question, and also the question about uh, how to actually, if it's not, if they are not, how to change them, how to reshape them, knowing that the challenges uh, are every time more urgent, but also knowing about the importance of knowledge for uh, facing uh, the development challenges. Uh, and as well that not any kind of knowledge. Uh, and so the importance of our, what kind of knowledge is actually required and necessary for the development challenges, who produces knowledge, how it's produced and so on. I think are the central questions of the project and the presentation. <laughs> and so the second reason why I'm very excited is because I know very well the, the researchers uh, from this project and, and I have known them for a long time and they are not just excellent researchers but also I know people uh, that are very committed uh, to these um, questions that have actually worked a whole life on these issues so I know that uh, the work that they will be presented here is a work that comes from years of uh, dedication and research in relation to these questions so I'm sure that will be, uh, it will be a very interesting and exciting presentation. Uh, so the biography of uh, Tommaso and so is in the paper. I'm not gonna go through that. I'll just say that they are um, excellent researchers and very good people. And so I will leave you with them and then come back for the questions. Yeah, and for comments. Thank you very much, um, Ben. Thanks for the great introduction. Um, and uh, I'm really honored um, to be here. I think um, I've, I've attended my first success development lecture in 2001 um, when I was a master's student here. It was an amazing source of inspiration. I'm much younger than that. I did my master's video. Early. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, it was an amazing source of inspiration and, and, and they continue to be. So I'm, I'm not um, aiming for that. We're not aiming for that. At least I'm not aiming for that today. But at least to share um, some important think, messages from uh, from this research. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the Institute of Development Studies and Saxon Development Lecture Organizers for uh, setting up um, this uh, this lecture. And um, this is this is going to be uh, we're going to be discussing results from uh, a project which has brought together uh, colleagues from. Uh, Campus here um, across uh, um, yeah, working on, on 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 different topics in relation to sustainable uh, development and science, technology, and uh, innovation in order to address uh, an issue which is, as uh, Annabelle was saying, quite urgent. Which is uh, how do we make sure that what we do, what other researchers do, what um, companies do in terms of developing science, technology, innovations, and any other actor in society is related to sustainable development. So <clears throat> um, 
Yeah. Uh, maybe it's um Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, I think I, I mean I have a very little amount of time, a very short amount of time to present uh, quite a lot of work that has been done over the years by a huge amount of religious uh, with whom we have been working um, across the globe. So this project was uh, a partnership between the Science Policy Research Unit um, at Sussex and uh, United Nations Development Program, together with other partners in Europe, in, in India, in uh, uh, Kenya, in South Africa, and in uh, Argentina. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's this huge amount of research which, uh, which has been done um, um, over um, these uh, these years by lots of people. I'm not going to make any justice to lots of, to to lot of this research, but going to focus on some of the main uh, issues. But let me start from uh, how we got to this work. Uh, we got to this work from a sort of several uh, understandings and several observations that. Although there's a lot of science, as we know, um, which do address uh, some of the lots of the societal challenges that we face, the science and the direction of science, which is produced, which are produced, are not particularly well uh, aligned to many of these challenges. So there's, uh, and we observe this in many different domains. We observe this in health, where, for example, most of the research is on illnesses which do not represent the illnesses which have the highest burden for people. We see this in agriculture where uh, countries tend to focus on research which is not related to their main priorities in terms of agriculture. We see this in terms of the type of researches, for example, in uh, again in health, where the simple fact that most of the researchers uh, which, which do advance knowledge in health are uh, males means that the diseases which are addressed are mainly diseases which concern the male population and not the female population. So we see a lot of inequality in addressing different challenges. And although there are priorities and you know there's budget constraints, so one would expect there to be priorities, it's always the challenges which affect those which are most in need, which are least addressed. So this is a huge problem. And uh, one could say that, um, and, and some people would uh, maintain that, but doing science is, is a public good. Doing science is going to be useful at some point. So it doesn't really matter how you direct the science, in which direction you do this science, which challenges you address, because it's going to be used at some point. And that's hugely problematic because it does matter. It does matter a lot if you address challenges which are related to a particular part of the population or to another part of the population. Again, uh, you can take the example of hand, whether you address uh, the hand uh, diseases of those uh, who, who, who have uh, cancer or, or whether you address the diseases of those who have malaria. Um, another, uh, you know, uh, if you want um, a reason for that, um, for having this uh, inequality between the focus of research and the challenges to address the problems, uh, which, which research try to address, is that it's not easy to identify which are the priorities. How do we define these priorities? There are many different priorities. It, may, it can depend on uh, lots of different needs, perceptions, uh, preferences across different uh, population, different types of society, different geographies. And that's obviously true. So the starting point here was that we now have the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we have had them actually for a few years now, which do identify some common challenges uh, which have been agreed across the globe uh, about what might be the most pressing issues that we need to address. So what might be the most pressing issues that also science, technology, innovation may need to address. So the science, uh, the, the sustainable development goals, in fact, do uh, determine some uh, objectives that we can address with science, technology, innovation. So the question is, do we address them? Um, and this is the research question that we pose in this project. Are the directions of science, technology, and innovation aligned related to the main needs which are 
um, um, embedded in the sustainable development goals. And <clears throat> the answer is no, otherwise we wouldn't be here. They're not aligned. Um, there's actually quite a lot of misalignment. Um, and we do highlight in this research a number of different mismatches between the priorities in science technology innovation and the uh, SDGs. And we do show that if we don't change the direction of science technology innovation, we can not only uh, 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 not achieve the SDGs, but science technology innovation may also be harmful to the SDGs as it is in many cases. And one example could be, for example, the, the research in uh, uh, science related to and research related to the defense uh, system, uh, which causes or is related to conflicts across the globe, which is definitely not including any of the SDGs. Um, so uh, a very uh, a couple of minutes, uh, or maybe just one minute on uh, how we got uh, to those misalignments, to understand these different misalignments and uh, finding some potential <coughs> uh, um, uh, policy recommendation to address them. First of all, uh, at one level, at a very high level, we analyzed uh, a large number of documents, which means publication from the web of science and uh, patents in order to understand <coughs> which are the direction of science and technology in different countries, regions, and how they relate to the SDGs. Second, we uh, set up a large um, survey, which uh, it was actually a data survey, which allow us uh, to um, engage a large number of stakeholders across the globe in different regions about what they think are the, should be the main direction of science and technology innovation in order to address the sustainable development goals. So forget what is done and what we can map in the, in the documents. What do people think should be done? What different stakeholders think should be done? And then uh, we try to understand with case studies in very specific context, how this direction of science and innovation are shaped by different actors, how um, some of these pathways to address science and innovation may be uh, um, privileged um, with respect to others and how these can increase or uh, in, uh, decrease the misalignment between science and innovation and uh, the SDGs. And uh, so what did the main um, um, challenges, the main uh, issues that we find are four, and I go to the first three, and then uh, I leave to sort of to elaborate the, um, let's say the most problematic one, which is the one which explains the other, uh, the first three. So the first one is a problem of orientation of research, of the global uh, research, which is not on the sustainable development goals for its, for its majority. And this is also due to the large imbalances, inequalities in funding and in doing such research, being mainly focused in some countries in the world. Second and uh, related is the focus, which this <coughs> uh, research around the globe has, uh, which is mainly on uh, issues which are technical solutions and particularly isolated to the other issues related to the SGs, so social issues and political issues. Um, and this, and as we see, this knowledge series can be very problematic because the SDGs, you know, uh, are, uh, uh, the different SDGs are very much interacting in terms of how improvement in one may uh, be detrimental to another SDG. Third, <clears throat> um, we do observe large misalignments, what countries do in terms of science and innovation, how they prioritize, what they prioritize, and their main sustainable development goals. And uh, fourth, um, which uh, uh, is behind, uh, as I said, the other three problems, there's a tendency to reduce as much as possible the diversity of science and innovation to privilege some of the pathways in science and technology innovation, leaving out <clears throat> a lot of the uh, 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 pathways which could address um, the, the, the same challenges in different ways, which may be preferred by different stakeholders. So in terms of the first problem, <clears throat> orientation inequality, what we see is that if you look at the research which is done by most of the countries, so high-income countries and upper middle income countries, and we're talking about around 90% of the research which is done globally, only between 20 and 40% of this research is related to the SDGs at all. The rest is totally unrelated to the SDGs. Now, if you take 
this 20 to 40 percent of research which is related to the SDGs, I must say, is not as low, it's still quite a lot of research which is done. But 60 percent of this research is on one specific SDG, which is health. And if you look at what research is done in health, again, is mainly issues in health which are related, which are particularly relevant in the global north. So whether this research, which is done on SDG, is relevant to this in the SDG is also not obvious. And one could say, yes, but um, there's um, 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 a lot of learning, there's a lot, there's a lot of collaboration internationally, uh, where you can have exchange of knowledge. So even if it is not this, this research, which is not done in uh, low-income countries, which is related to the SDGs, um, sorry, um, even if there is, there, there is no research, which is that most of the research is done by income countries, so income countries can learn from collaborations. This is actually, again, not true, because as, as you see here, uh, the share of collaborations between low-income countries and, and higher upper income countries is extremely low. Um, <clears throat> now, the interesting thing is that if you look at the research which is done in low-income countries, then most of it, and we're talking about between 70 and, and 80%, is on the SDGs. However, this research is not driving proper research because the research which is done in low-income countries represents around 0.2% of the research which is published in the web of science. So the research which is driven by anchoring countries, which is most of the research, is not aligned, and is not aligned particularly because it is driven by uh, high-income countries. Second, as you mentioned, there's a problem of focusing on issues which are mainly technical issues. So most of the research is on issues related to climate action, uh, energy, uh, health, as we mentioned before, and <clears throat> issues with, as issues related to the SDGs, which are particularly uh, relevant to address uh, political uh, challenges, inequality challenges, social science challenges, deprivation, conflicts, so on and so forth. Uh, get a minority of the funding. So they're less uh, prioritized. Not only they're less prioritized, but what we observe is that most of the uh, most of the research in, in these areas, in this, on these SDGs, is also relatively isolated. So for example, take research on SDG 9, which is industry and innovation. Research in and SDG 9 does not, is not done in relation to research on other SDGs, such as poverty, inequality, or conflict but it's in relation mainly to technical solutions. And this obviously prevents us from understanding how those te technical solutions interact, uh, improve or harm uh, issues such as inequality and uh, poverty. Um, and we know instead, and this is from the, the, the results from our global survey, that if you take any of the technologies that people think could address the SDGs, they're normally related to a very large number of SDGs. And, and they can be related in positive and in negative ways. So one example that, uh, that we see in, 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 our, um, in, in the response of the stakeholders is, for example, blockchain. Blockchain can uh, improve access to finance, can improve waste management, but it can also have detrimental effect in sexual exploitation and in energy consumption. So you need to think carefully about these technologies and how they can interact uh, with different SDGs, positively and uh, negatively. And if you do research in isolation, focusing on very specific SDG, for example, on the technical issues, you cannot take into account those synergies and uh, um, <clears throat> tensions. Um, and in fact, when we ask about our stakeholders about what kind of research they think might be addressed the SDGs by 2030, um, that's a minority of them which refer to <clears throat> technologies which are uh, particularly related to technical solutions or existing technology, most of them would um, point to policy innovations, changes in values and uh, direction, social innovations. And just to say that most of our respondents here are researchers themselves. And so around 80% of those who are responding were indicating what might be the prior innovation priorities <laughs> in order to address the SDGs are those doing research themselves. Um, and uh, when we get to the types of research which is, uh, which is done globally, which is mostly funded, again, this is research which is mainly on technical solution. When you look at uh, research which is mostly related to people in society, this is least funded and uh, have much less collaboration, despite being the research which is most 
used in policy, most used uh, by users. If we look at uh, the, the, the uh, representation of this research, for example, in social media and in uh, news. So again, there is a, a, a strong privilege in uh, certain areas of research and particularly in uh, isolation. Third, and um, I'm gonna close here, is this problem of regional misalignment. So we look at, let's say, even then, uh, Annabelle is our chair today. Let's take the example of Argentina. What we map here is where a country such as Argentina does worst in terms of SDGs. So what are the main SDG challenges in each of the countries? Take, for example, Argentina, which is reduced <clears throat> inequalities and uh, non uh, science technology innovations. And, and then we look at where Argentina specializes. And what we see is that most of the specialization is on SDGs, which are not those which represent the main issues in the country. And in general, when we do this for most countries, we do observe this type of misalignments almost everywhere. And that's the, we did the example of Argentina, but we can take the example of high income countries, which are the countries which pollute most. So which has the main uh, um, SDG issues in SDG 12, 13, 14, and 15, and are definitely not specialized in research on those SDGs. Um, the only areas in which we do see an alignment is those areas such as um, hunger and um, clean water and sanitation, where over the years there's been historically and traditionally a strong focus of investment, particularly by foreign donors. And um, I would like, like to move to the fourth challenge, which is um, oh. how we address all this. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so uh, I'm, my name is Saurabh. Uh, I'm the sidekick here today. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of a discussion of the case studies, which uh, the work obviously is not mine. I must admit that right away and specify that this is a work that has been done by a number of colleagues uh, based in Argentina, India, and Kenya. So I am just a front for uh, you know, an, a, an amazing team that you can't see here today. And I hope uh, what I'm going to say is going to be satisfactory for them. Um, and uh, primarily, I'm going to focus on one of these three case studies later on, which will be the India story. Uh, so the bottom here focused on uh, seeds for uh, resilient, uh, climate resilient rice seeds in a particular part of India, which is uh, in the southeast called Parisha. And colleagues who worked on it, uh, the crisp colleagues, they were in the pictures that uh, Tomasa showed. They, their names are Rashid Suleiman, Nimisha, Mithil, and uh, Bhuvana N, who are obviously uh, not here today, unfortunately. So I'm speaking on behalf. So these um, three case studies obviously are addressing different SDG issues in different parts of the world. They were meant to provide sort of local insights, detail that is often overlooked in the large scale pictures that Tommaso presented based upon um, you know, databases such as Web of Science or PathStat. So the first case study was in Argentina, which was focused on different ways, different uh, methods, sciences, knowledges through which uh, Argentinians are tackling the Chagas disease, which is the, I don't know whether you know about it, is the kissing, more, more famously, more commonly known as the kissing bug disease. Uh, disease that affects, it seems, poor people more in Argentina than the rich. Um, and it has been around prevalent for over 100 years uh, and public health issue that is also often called a neglected disease uh, in some circles. The second uh, case study looked at overfishing and con conflicts around fishing in, in the Lake Victoria region, particularly on the Kenyan side. And this study was led by colleagues based in Kenya as well as in South Africa, John Mugabe being the lead. Um, and uh, of course, a number of different SDGs are involved here as well. And then finally, I already mentioned the India case study. Now, the, the way we approached these studies was, of course, we wanted to capture not just one way forward, one way to do things. We actually wanted to pay attention to diversity of different pathways that are available, that people are trying out, practicing on the ground. So um, rather than saying there is only one way to do science, there's only one world, and, one nature and one science and one body of knowledge, one direction forward. We embraced a framework based upon the step center here in at IDS and Screw and other places. 
uh, which says there are diverse directions, plural directions of progress in SDI or in any given area of activity to address any social ecological problem. And within the pathways, it's not just about techno-scientific developments because it's easy to embrace diversity of techno-scientific developments, but also equally about ecological diversities, equally also about political economic diversities. So it's pathways are places where uh, techno-scientific developments are entangled with uh, social, economic, ecological changes. Um, and in each of the case studies, we looked at two to three pathways. So, for example, in the Kenyan uh, overfishing conflict, we looked at um, ways to monitor what's going on with overfishing and fishing, so monitoring control surveillance systems. We looked at alternatives such as pond fishing or cage aquaculture and so on. Um, in Argentina, we looked at open science and closed science pathways for addressing Chagas. Uh, Chagas disease, right? That's the one. Yeah. Um, and then, not only did we want to embrace these diversity of pathways or understand these diversities of pathways in each of the cases, we also wanted to provide plural perspectives on each of those pathways. We didn't want to, we didn't want to project a picture that says there is only one way to appraise this pathway as sustainable or unsustainable, but instead we wanted to put forward a number of different perspectives coming from different actor groups in the field. So here, for this purpose, we, we adopted a method, which also is a Sussex method, uh, developed firstly by my colleague Siti Kapode, <laughs> Andy Sterling, and it's called multi-criteria mapping. And um, it's a, actually a software tool that anybody can use. So we used it in different settings in the, in the form of a workshop format in Kenya, through individual interviews with 20 to 25 people in India and in uh, Argentina. And we interviewed people from various different professional backgrounds, such as policymakers, society practitioners, farmers, extension workers, fishers, and so on. So there was church people even in, in the Kenyan story. Um, so, and rather than, again, asking for people to provide one particular appraisal, we ask them to select their own criteria using which they want to appraise these pathways. And not only did we ask them to select their own criteria using which they want to appraise these pathways, we also asked them to specify to rate or evaluate or appraise each pathway with a performance score, not just under pessimistic conditions when things are not going well, such as rainfall is not right or whatever, but also under optimistic conditions when things are actually working really, really well. Okay, so, um, and these criteria on the side there are obviously associated with different SDGs. We, we urged, uh, requested the participants in each case study to select criteria for assessing, appraising these pathways, which had, um, some relevance to the SDGs. So let me give you uh, an example here uh, of these plural perspectives. In, in the Indian case from Odisha, um, we looked at two different STI pathways for developing rice seeds, promoting rice seeds for resilience. Uh, one of these is the traditional Green Revolution style agricultural modernization pathway where you develop these seeds inside laboratories and then you promote them among farmers using extension workers. Um, the second one, and here, second one is more based upon in situ uh, sort of saving of seeds by farmers, but also exchanging of seeds among farmers in their local communities and networks beyond local communities. And what we found was obviously state institutions and private firms played a large role in the breeding pathway, but somewhat of a smaller role in the so-called conserving pathway here, where civil society uh, organizations, farmers associations, local seed champions, who would basically, there are people in Rhodesia who who have saved uh, hundreds, if not thousands of varieties of some seeds in their localities, in their communities. So by the way, just to give you a bit of context as well here, rice, before the so-called Green Revolution in the 1960s and 70s, they, rice has been grown in, in South Asia for 7,000 odd years, they say. And uh, in the 1950s, there were about 10,000 varieties of rice that were grown. Oh no, 100,000 varieties of rice, if I'm correct, that were grown in the 1950s. By the 1990s, in the post-green revolution era, when there were already a lot of high-yielding varieties that have been delivered, funded by the Ford and the Rockefeller Foundation, by the Indian government and extension services and private firms, this diversity of agricultural biodiversity of seeds was reduced to 7,000. And uh, it seems nowadays, most of the rice that is grown in India comes from 50 odd varieties, rather than 100,000 that used to be the case in um, 50, oh, 70, 80 years ago. Now, Taking these two pathways, the descriptions of which we provided to the participants in the study, um, we asked them to then appraise these two pathways according to the criteria that they found as relevant and important. So here, uh, 
different actors, groups, farmers, researchers, policymakers, extension workers, selected uh, agrobiodiversity. Um, not all of them, by the way, selected these different criteria. Some prioritized some some of these and the others, others focused on the on, on sort of farmers, for example, did not consider agrobiodiversity as an important criterion for them, which was a surprise for us. Um, but malnutrition was, for example, foregrounded by policymakers and uh, extension workers and so on. So there were these different uh, criteria that we sort of, I think there were about 130 different criteria raised, brought up by the participants, which we clubbed into what we called issues. So these would be the six or seven issues that we identified. And uh, these are some of the results from this MCM exercise. Here you can see um, the different perspectives. So perspectives of farmers. So farmers, for example, uh, consider the conserving pathway uh, to be somewhat better when it comes to accessibility, the price of the seeds and local, local availability. Um, for So far as the economic issues are concerned, they uh, find the optimistic scores on average of the breeding pathway to be somewhat higher. So if the conditions are good, if rainfall is there, if uh, market conditions or the price is right, then they say, yes, we will, the, the, the breeding pathway is likely to produce higher profits for us. But if the conditions are not right under pessimistic conditions, it's also likely to produce a bigger loss because we've invested in farm inputs, pesticides, fertilizers, seeds, and so on. Whereas the conserving pathway is because, because we are saving our own seeds and we're using less chemicals, if no chemicals sometimes, our losses are also low. So that means the uncertainty, which is the number inside these boxes, is smaller, according to farmers, for the conserving pathway. Yeah? So the uncertainty is here simply the, the interval that is between the average pessimistic score and the average optimistic score by this group. Am I correct, Andy? Yes. Yes, good. <laughs> so then, uh, finally, for this usability issue, uh, for, the, for, the farm, for the farmers again, they... Um, of course, very strongly prefer the conserving pathway, both in terms of optimistic and pessimistic scores. Um, and usability is about fragrance, culture, the usefulness and the spiritual value in sacred rituals of the rice varieties, because only some rice varieties can be used in those sacred rituals. These are also Adivasi indigenous communities we're talking about here. Um, and uh, taste, fragrance and sort of quality, people thought the traditional heirloom varieties of rice did a better job for them. At least the farmers thought that. Different perspectives and policymakers have slightly somewhat different perspectives from the farmers. Uh, but of course, what is interesting here is that whether you look at policymakers or researchers, I, I can move this. Uh, yeah. Then you see, for agrobiodiversity, there seems to be a consensus here, an agreement between different perspectives. Yes, yes. The conserving pathway with heirloom varieties that have been passed down generations and sometimes even redeveloped by farmers through sharing and exchanging of knowledge are better performing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the aim here by providing these different perspectives is not to just highlight these points where we find agreement. Obviously, these are great that we find this agreement on agrobiodiversity issues, but also to, to show differences in perspectives. And these differences also then point to the, let me, before I conclude, um, these are sort of a combined set of, we put all the different groups together, all the different professional groups together and produce a picture, um, an overall picture uh, to show these points of agreement. So here we find agreement for agrobiodiversity. Obviously you can see how um, they're clearly better performing than all actors, but we also find because of the differences, some sort of overlaps and, and, and lack of clarity and other things, ambiguity between the perspectives. Now, by highlighting these differences, it's not to the point of here, there's conflict here. What we are trying to get at is to say that, well, for certain issues, we know which pathways to support. For agrobiodiversity, it's clear, all actors are agreeing, there's consensus, we need to put more support for a much neglected pathway that is the conserving pathway, because most government subsidy, most R&D investment, goes to the breeding pathway, which is the institutionally dominant, economically dominant pathway currently in India and has been for the last 50 years. Hardly any government support goes to the conserving pathway. So if you want to protect agrobiodiversity, then clearly to address that SDG, more support needs to go for this conserving pathway. But for other pathways, 
uh, sorry, other concerns, other issues, other SDGs, the picture is much more ambiguous. So then the idea emerges, well, let's at least balance the playing field because obviously here conserving pathway, people don't think it is any, any worse in many of these other issues as well, from usability, from plant stress to even economic terms, much worse than the breeding pathway. So why is there so much policy support, institutional support, funding support going only to one pathway? Why can't we make the playing field more equal and make the institutional support more balanced between these different diverse pathways? Yeah, so that would be the conclusion from my side. So I'm going to stop now. Um, Tomaso <laughs> will conclude, so provide policy lessons and everything. I'll take my interview. So I hope you are listening to me. <laughs> I hope the, the, that we have been clear enough on the issues uh, of this environment and, and how this uh, can grow up from the, from the bottom, from this lack of attention to diversity. So let me um, go back to the, uh, say, some uh, few points about how we can address uh, all these misalignments uh, in, the, in the last five minutes. So four different areas which uh, we are indica indicate. The first one is mostly related to the uh, research side. So if you talk about the KRI, if you talk about the research funders, not only the national research funders, the global research funders, the, the international organizations, uh, we obviously need to increase research which is related to the SDGs, okay? Because most of the research you see is not aligned. And uh, there's some very easy ways of doing that, just doing more research um, where the leaders, where the, the, uh, um, which, is, which is led mainly in uh, uh, low countries, would already increase uh, the research which is related to the SDGs. Uh, we definitely need to put more funding on those underlying issues, which are not only the technical solutions, but which do interact with the technical solutions and uh, the more technical issues, because otherwise, again, we uh, uh, we, we we can uh, uh, have a, a, a situation where um, science and conservation can harm the SDGs rather than contributing to them. Uh, we need much more attention to social policy and grassroots innovations that we do, and um, I think the 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 uh, example of the case study that Sarah was mentioning is is quite strong uh, indicator, even if it is one case study, but we find this throughout when we ask many different stakeholders. Um, and uh, we need to address uh, issues which are relevant in different contexts and how this relevance changes, shifts over time, not being stuck to one uh, 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 specific uh, challenge in uh, which, which does, doesn't evolve over time, as we've seen for you know funding, which has been um, uh, being prioritized over low income countries through in the last few decades. Uh, we need a much more uh, involvement of different actors, different stakeholders, so that those diverse and plural views are taken into account when making decisions about funding. Um, and uh, those decisions also have to be much more uh, democratic, much more open, much more uh, 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 challenged. Um, we need to create more opportunities for knowledge transfer between different uh, actors in the same region, across different regions. But these uh, collaborations in research need to be much more equitable than they are, where uh, most uh, of our research and most of our collaborations with researchers in different parts of the world are to extract data, but less uh, to, as we also did here. Uh, but less to uh, um, involve uh, the, 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 the uh, researchers in setting the main priorities. And we also uh, need to look at the roots about the incentives for doing research for all of us, but for all the system. So when we consider the evaluation system, which is mainly based on the uh, uh, producing science, which is uh, at the frontier, producing research, which is at the frontier, producing uh, profits, then uh, we're evaluating the research that we're doing not in terms of what is the impact, for example, on each of these SDGs of the research that we're doing, but how it is considered in terms of scientific excellence and, uh, and prioritized in, uh, in universities. So that is important that we value the research uh, which is relevant and uh, not just research which is excellent. 
Um, as uh, I think has been uh, clear in uh, before in the uh, uh, presentation by Sorb, we need to promote diversity rather than reduce diversity. So we need to keep those channels for increasing not only the participation but also for increasing the uh, uh, voice of different um, uh, different stakeholders involved in uh, the definitions involved in decision making about science and technology innovations always open uh, this is because it's impossible and then we go much more in depth in uh, in, in the report about that um, it's impossible to address the complexity of those issues related to the SDGs if we do not take into account the diversity which is behind uh, that that complexity so we need to maintain um, those different portfolios in investment of science and conservation without reducing the uh, um, the, the pathways to singular uh, pathways um, we also have a few um, proposals in terms of creating um, open inclusive uh, uh, platform observatory in order to monitor what kind of investments are done in uh, at the global level at regional level and national levels in science and technology and innovation so the kind of uh, work that you know we did in a very small work that we did in our project but at a much larger scale with uh, better data I'll discuss that uh, in a second uh, so that uh, there's a much better understanding of what is going on in terms of research, what is prioritized, by whom, who takes decision, so on and uh, so forth. This is heavily uh, lacking uh, in in many areas. Again, the kind of uh, information that we, we 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 look at here is information which is publicly available, like a publication patterns. But most of the research which is done, which is prioritized, particularly in the private sector or in the defense sector, there's no knowledge about that. Um, and uh, finally, we need uh, to uh, make uh, those uh, those tools and those results available for different people to express different views about what are their priorities and about how they think the research which is done, the innovations which are uh, uh, advanced and implemented are related to different issues. Because there can be very different views about research which is uh, which is done, for example, on um, nuclear energy is it a research which is related to achieving SG7 or not um, and and which other uh, SG it may be harming so it is important that different people can have different views about how the research that uh, we can map once we've done this 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 exercise of mapping is actually related to the uh, uh, different uh, challenges and very importantly and this is a a uh, very big cover for uh, part of this research, particularly the, the uh, global mapping of this research, we need much better understanding of the science, technology, innovation, which is then the knowledge which is produced in settings that we do not observe in the kind of uh, uh, data that we use here, such as publications in the web of science or patents. Uh, you know, there's much more knowledge production than that. Uh, we simply do not have the uh, information to look at it so as usual we you know we look at where the light is but we don't look at where the problem is simply because we, we miss the information so it's very important that we invest a lot of effort in capturing uh, those uh, knowledge productions okay let me just conclude here uh, i think as a main message is that <clears throat> You mentioned most of the research is not aligned to the SDGs, uh, and 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 this is because there is also a tendency of closing down the directions of research towards very specific uh, uh, pathways, which not all agree are the most important. Um, so just doing more research will not lead to improving to addressing the SDGs. We need to look at what is the what are the directions of these issues, which are the priorities and how they are aligned with different issues and how these different issues are perceived in different contexts, different parts of the society. And this is extremely important if we want to use research and, and put all this money in, in that we're putting in research, in, in research technology and innovation in order to achieve a sustainable uh, development. I'll stop here and uh, yeah, if you want to do the other report, this is the link. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it over again to Annabelle for the discussion. 
Okay, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Um, so before I uh, open up for questions, I was asked to react with some comments. So I uh, will do that and then to open up uh, the floor for some questions and comments and so on. So a few comments. First, um, I want to say that I really appreciate very much the incredible work that you have done to pull all this evidence together on issues that we have been investigating, debating for a long time, but for which we have a lot of anecdotal evidence. And I just uh, appreciate the effort to put all this evidence together and to show actually the, the huge mismatch at um, looking at all this evidence together for different countries and um, at, at, this, at this scale. And I think, uh, this is very important because in a way it's a clear invitation to take action uh, to really put all this uh, uh, together in a way that really show the magnitude of the problem and i so that's the first comment the second um i also appreciate very much your the invitations that you do then you walk to take action and the kind of recommendations uh, which i think are very aligned in a way to um again, to discussions uh, uh, about the, what are the relevant and, and more urgent things that we need to address when thinking about science policy uh, during the last um, year. So for example, issues like uh, transdisciplinarity, lo more locally adapted research are all issues that we have been discussing for a long time. And I think I like in a way that how you relate the problems that you identify within the actions that need to be taken to address them. So I think that, again, pulling all this together in a very structured and systematic way, I think is very important. And I also like probably something that I noticed that I haven't seen so much before is this uh, finding about the isolation and how do you uh, really show how research uh, seems to be focusing on a specific kind of technology fixes uh, in relation to particular problems, but then, if this research is really not well connected to uh, kind of, uh, for example, uh, research in social science, which uh, is relevant in terms of, for example, how you apply these technologies or how the impact of these technologies and so on. I think that point is very important and interesting that I uh, noticed uh, from your results. But of course, then uh, the question is, uh, when we think about how to take action and move away from all these problems is how? And so the big issue there is the issue of power, which of course, you know, we all know, uh, because when we start to think about how we move away from these uh, challenges and how we start to take these actions, like for example, adopting more kind of transdisciplinary uh, approaches to research, how to prioritize uh, alternatives and so on, we have the big issue of power, but we also have the big issue of uh, structural tensions. I mean, thinking, um, very much about the example of Argentina. You mentioned the example of seeds, um, uh, uh, an area that I know very well in Argentina. Uh, the, why, why so much research goes to breeding, scientific breeding, and not to other, uh, like for example, you say conservationist or other approaches, like even for example, the one we have been uh, working for a long time on participatory breeding. Well, there is a huge issue and a structural thing there that most of the economy depends on the agricultural sector. The agricultural sector is the one that is funding a lot of this research and the seed sector is, is a key sector for this agricultural sector and so on. So you have a structural thing there together with the power thing playing, which is not so easy to address. And so I, I, don't, I mean, even if I don't like it so much, I can, I can see very clearly why most of the funds have gone, for example, to projects, uh, research projects in Argentina that go to identify the um, transgenic event that will uh, save the Argentinian uh, agriculture. So this is part of the whole structure of the economy and so on. So this is uh, obviously something that you already know. I just mentioned that because I think that when thinking about how we move away from that, then so what, what, what is the next step? And so it's something we have to think about really experiments, where we are really trying to do things in a different way in terms of how we take decisions and how we play with these things. So we start to see how things might look like different if we start to take decisions in different ways and so on. So I, this kind of discussion is what I think probably 
is what is coming next uh, after reading uh, your your work and I just uh, think that probably we should be thinking a bit more on that of how we really start to move away from these issues in reality and, and with action research projects and in which kind of design and so on and then uh, a methodological comment um, I'm just looking at um, and again, when you were presenting and by reading it made me think, um, really, I mean, we know that knowledge, knowledge is relevant to the development challenges. Then the, when looking at your work, I mean, I'm just wonder, wondering if all this is segregation around the development goals. I mean, how did you work out some form? This is a question, <laughs> a way of aggregating the, the, the development goals. Because I, I don't know, it's not convincing for me uh, that because you don't have research on a specific development goal, then you will not be addressing this particular development challenge. So, um, the, I mean, I don't uh, really, uh, I mean, we have addressed a lot of the development challenges, not doing research specifically oriented to this challenge, but maybe more in, uh, not directly, but in the indirectly. So, I don't know, methodologically, I don't know if you, try to just group these challenges in some way, the development goals and maybe some way that might help to think a bit more these connections between the knowledge and the challenges, because this level of the segregation is a bit confusing for me. Um, that's just the last comment, the, the development, I mean, you end up with your conclusion about, well, and more money into developing countries with already start to help to address the problem then, my reaction to that is developing countries is such too big <laughs> category. I mean, developing countries in South America with their own uh, way of funding research is a completely world to how, uh, uh, for example, if we think about African countries and how all these issues of power and structural economy and so on play are very different. So uh, there is something to think about in terms of the conclusions. And finally, um, this idea of global, global platform. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of questions about that. <laughs> because it will speak okay. <laughs> contradictory with this idea of more uh, the need of being uh, more and more locally focused and the global initiatives and the experiences we have of global initiatives to address development challenges are not really good. <laughs> so that's uh, my last comment. So now I open up for questions, probably first here, and then we can take some from the chat, no? Yeah. Thanks very much for a fascinating talk. And um, my comment really, um, it's a question and a comment, it really picks up on what Annabelle was just referring to. And I guess what I was trying to, as you were talking, I was thinking about, is there a sort of a bigger, more structural misalignment that's going on? It's not just between particular goals, it's between the way in which our economies are organized um, and the sorts of things we're trying to do with these SDGs. So I was thinking, are there, are there structural, conditions or imperatives that disable or inhibit our ability or likelihood of ever reaching the SDGs. And I'm thinking the pursuit of economic growth as traditionally defined or the role of militarism, which is sort of, it was lurking there a little bit. I think Tomasi mentioned defense at one point, but it felt like a little bit like the elephant in the room <laughs> as, as a sort of force, which is shaping many of these developments uh, or our ability to deliver on a whole range of, of SDGs. And so it comes back to Annabelle's point about power, like, Underneath, associated with each of these SDGs in a way, are a set of constellations, actors, constituencies that are fundamentally misaligned. And all of those SDGs are not equal, are they, right? So SDGs eight to nine that you were talking about, growth and innovation and so on, nearly always trump, in my experience at least, um, the delivery of other things around, you know, clean water, access to clean energy, food, sustainable land practices, all of those sorts of things. So the, the sort of so what question that Annabelle has already raised would be who would be your allies, um, who is open to a, a conversation about doing things differently um, beyond the sort of more incremental things about different platforms, different tools for engaging people. Are there ways in which you can shift the conversation more radically to sort of unsettle somehow some of the power relations, which are for me are the sort of underlying reason why we failed to deliver the MDGs and we're probably going to fail to deliver many of the SDGs unless we deal with the things which are which are holding 
well, it's, maybe it's just about incumbency, but it's, it's the power question, really. I'm just putting it in a less articulate way than Annabelle, but any reflections on that would be welcome. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you. It was a fascinating talk. Uh, so my question was to just understand, um, so when you talk about the research and development, uh, do you have a distribution in your report that where is it getting funded from? Like, is there a, is it governments? Is it uh, corporations? Is it, you know, universities? So is there a, is, is there a distribution that you see and a misalignment between, you know, sections where research is getting funded and how that is playing out in the misalignment? Thanks. Thanks, Austin, for a very interesting presentation. I guess my question is more methodological, and it's for uh, the bit presented by Sora. Um, and it's about the two pathways that you've identified. And my question is where those two pathways come from. Is this your own definition, something that would put you the uh, groups you're interacting with, or was it something that emerged from the research? And the reason I'm asking this question is that you could uh, imagine a situation looking at uh, how, for example, how farmers engage with different technologies of their lives being much more of a, a combination of uh, bits of what you would call the breeding pathway, connections with Green Revolution type of technology, and other instances where they do things differently. So I'm just wondering uh, where are that perspective of a clear separation between pathways, where is that coming from? And to what extent is your uh, methodology uh, really open to capturing a diversity of pathways that potentially combine elements of those two and perhaps something, something else? Yeah. yeah, shall we shall we start? And um, I'm, I'll be happy to share some of the uh, responses with uh, Sorb and Andy, um, particularly the, the first one. And uh, so, um, also should we come back? I think I think it's important to come back to some of the observations by um, Anna Ben and. But let me start from the 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 power question that uh, that you raised um, and and the the where the lies, which also relate a little bit to the global platform, but the global platform I probably leave it completely to Andy. Um, so, yeah, I think I think you're totally right. Uh, you're both totally right. Um, there are a number of. Uh, Lots of forces that that are at play here. I mean, we we know as as an example, we've been using a QWERTY keyboard um, for two hundred years, and uh, it's 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 suboptimal. Uh, so you know, the simple fact that it's very costly to change that keyboard across uh, all organizations in the world, it it means that we keep using something which is uh, a suboptimal direction, a suboptimal technology. Um, but there's, 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 there's many other things, of course. Uh, it's also, I think, important to say that is some of the challenges, which are more social political challenges, are more difficult. I mean, they seem easier, but, but they're definitely much more difficult. So doing research on, on improving batteries or improving solar panels, it's easier. You have, you know, tracks, but addressing real issues of inequality includes policy discussion, includes involving people, includes uh, addressing conflicts. And, and that's, that's not just research, right? That's, uh, that's, that's much more research, even though you, know, you could have much more uh, research, I think, still, uh, which is connected to those uh, technical solutions, because some of these technical solutions, as uh, Sorb was also um, hinting at, they can be harmful. Um, I'll, I'll say just, I mean, the, the where to look in terms of uh, alliance, I'll probably um, start looking at, in my case, what is closest to us, research councils. Yeah, simply talk to research councils and say, why don't we change the way, don't you change the way in which you decide how you fund research and how you evaluate research? Because this plays a big role. And I think evaluation, again, here, evaluation is kind of key. I mean, um, we're focusing mainly on, on on research which is done by which is published, so it's done by researchers here, um, public researchers. There's very little private 
Um, and and you know the the our incentives in the end is is to have more papers, right? And 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 we're pushed to do that. Um, and you know we we try to do something which is useful, but in the end it's uh, it's also uh, you know our salary, our promotion, so on and so forth. And until that changes, it's very difficult. So I think the the to start with, there's a large responsibility of funding agencies and and with that uh, international organizations uh, global funders like uh, foundations like Bill Melinda Gates whatever that uh, fund research with, with specific um, 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 uh, objectives in mind <laughs> uh, but um, I hope that uh, Andy and Sorok will also come back to this uh, to this question uh, let me go briefly to the um, meteorological questions and then I'll uh, so, so then just pass it on um, <clears throat> on the um, funding sources uh, unfortunately not and and this is was one of the reasons for thinking about this global platform I think you're totally right uh, about you know just we have enough global platforms uh, but but a way so an authority which can have better information about the funding sources who's directing this this research is important so for publications we could have you know we could we could see where the funder is if it is uh, uk ri if it is uh, uh, european commission if it is foundation we can see but that's only for publication then if you go to meet research uh, companies research then it's much more difficult but one important point there is that when we look at the these misalignments um and for example in the case of hand i think uh, it's very important to say if you look at work that that have been done by some of our colleague uh, colleagues um in in uh, uh, cwts ismail uh, raffles and colleagues if you look at the um focus of research in hand in terms of looking particularly at diseases which are diseases in the global north which are not the diseases which uh, have the strongest burden on, on people's lives this is not led by private research this is exactly the same in private and public research so i go back to the alliances there at least public research should take a different path right should compensate uh, for for the incentives that the private research uh, has uh, but the sort the short answer is we don't have enough data about that unfortunately so uh, we, we we make some uh, um, you know um, uh, guesses about the, for example, the the the, the focus in low income countries uh, on uh, hunger as something which has been funded and held and and clean water said is something that's been handed funded for a long time by uh, global donors. Um, and um, <clears throat> weekly on the on the SDGs, I mean, this is a very uh, how we aggregated them. This is a, a little bit of a um, long uh, discussion, but to keep it very search, uh, short, um, we look at different sources about how different outlets, people, blogs, um, reports define the SDGs. So to have to try to maintain this uh, different understanding, plural understanding of what SDG means. Um, so we collect these bags of definitions. And then we extract um, terms for these different definitions of the different SDGs. And then we look at, we don't look at uh, single uh, publications, but we look at areas. So we create uh, areas of research, which may be related to more uh, one or two different SDGs. So we try not to uh, aggregate in that sense, but to actually understand in this pool of research in different areas, what are the SDGs that different areas address? So you may have areas in hand which address both health and poverty and inequality, or you may have areas in hand which address only, only health. But I'll, I'll keep it short because the methodological discussion is a bit long, but I'm happy to go back to that. Um, I hope I've covered everything. And... Uh, thank you. Uh, the MCM question, Lydia. Um, the We ourselves, based upon literature review and interviews, in combination with the other documents, uh, we, we came up with the two pathways. That's a separate chapter in which we define them, and then we offer a succinct, brief definition of those, those two pathways to the participants in, in the MCM study. But in this particular operationalization of MCM, we chose not to offer the option of 
defining a new pathway to the participants. Uh, we wanted to, you know, short of time. We didn't think that was going to work out well here. But in um, other MCM work, it is possible that the participants themselves define like a kind of a hybrid pathway that you're talking about where farmers are combining um, all kinds of high yielding varieties of, of, of rice with, with organic agriculture. But, you know, so that, that is indeed possible in, a, in an MCM exercise. We did not do that um, uh, part of the process in this project. So we offered definitions of pathways in each case study. <laughs> So yeah, that's a kind of a drawback that we missed out on the complexities of hybrids that are obviously practiced on the ground and possible indeed. But just in our in our defense, very meager, weak defense that in Orissa, in this area, because it's an Adivasi dominated area, indigenous people of India, you know, they, we work with them. They are the ones doing uh, alum varieties in this particular region of Orissa, Koraput. Uh, so because of the preponderance of the Adivasi peoples, uh, I think there is still a distinction that we can draw quite clearly sometimes in some villages, some communities between the conserving and the industrial pathways. So that's my only defense. Um, in terms of power, um, yeah, that's a big question. We, I don't think we, we sort of did justice to it in the report, but we did try it in the introduction, you know, you, you you can find questions being asked about power and privilege and the fact that per capita income in rich countries is like 100 times that of NICs on average, et cetera, et cetera. So we did talk about those things and how sanitation access is so heavily unequally distributed, how uh, neonatal mortality rate is a factor of 42 times difference between the low income countries and the high income countries. So we did try to do some justice. Obviously, space did not permit for us to do an in-depth analysis of, of those power structures. Uh, in other words, you know, I am doing it, obviously, and he's doing it, many of us are doing it. And I think here, uh, recently, we've had another discussion on limits to growth, etc. It's, it's proof celebrating or not celebrating the 50th anniversary of that book. Uh, and then uh, um, at the Marie Hoda lecture in relation to growth and degrowth, etc. So there, at least my perspective has been, and in, in collaboration here with Andy, that we need to look sometimes beyond the traditional framings of where the problem might lie, structurally speaking. We've been devoting too much attention perhaps to locating the problem inside growth, too much attention to perhaps locating the problem inside capitalism. While perhaps there are longer, deeper structures here at play, uh, such as the modern world, such as coloniality, that shape across private public divides, similar trajectories of focus. So what Tomas was saying, how come we don't find this difference in health research where southern countries such as India are heavily addressing in their research priorities northern diseases? Why is that? And it's not just private research. It's not just to capture a northern market. It is also publicly funded for the Indian public research, doing that research. Why? This is completely brainless. But this is what is happening inside uh, the modern world we live in, which has been intrinsically shaped by a 530, 530, 530 year long history today, and we don't often address it. So uh, I think those are the ways in which we need to face these power structures by highlighting that there's something deeper beyond capitalism. There's something you know more extensive, wider beyond growth uh, or neoliberalism or capitalism that is driving those agendas. That's it from my side. Thank you. <laughs> So shall I say, I mean, just to build on what Sora has actually said on, because it's this a crucial challenge on what you call the unsettling power and you were raising as well, Annabelle. And in addition then to the, the points that Sora raised, we do talk about how there's not really enough to do justice to its importance. But don't take everything in face value for unsettled power, right? You don't necessarily put your fist up and say you're all bad power. You disrupt and destabilize the hegemonic structures that consolidate that. Way. So, so there, the SDGs are not a template or proven, they're a resource, a pivot point, a attraction against power at the deep and broad level soil of colonial modernity, which impacts on us arguably most deeply in shaping the way even critics think. So that you know, for critics, it seems that growth or capitalism as big as it gets. And yet the SDGs, 
address the knowledge challenges which are prior to and beyond capital inequality, environmental degradation in the SDG century, or if you like me, down there. And they're bigger than capitalists, it's not just capitalists, of course, they're problems. So if it's colonial modernity, then, to want a better word, it shapes even the understanding of critics, then actually, in the voice of the UN, you know, this is a UN report. So if you kind of like in diversity, plurality, direction, these central concepts, in the voice of the UN on science and technology at the heart of colonial modernity, is a subversive, disruptive thing to do in itself, even if you don't talk about power, which we do, even if you didn't talk about power at all. And so then it can be, it's a dangerous thing. It's not about compromising, it's about disrupting the idea of a platform observatory on democracies, from our perspective, in science and technology, is really grappling with the heart of the beast. Even if the actual proposal to look incredibly more down the channels do, you know, it's much more prosperous, but it's part of the game. Uh, so it's an inadequate response, but it's rightly or wrongly that central. It's not just the content of the analysis, it's the whole media message. Um, just as a short uh, response to that, but at the same time, um, you know, with the SDGs in their framing, and we've also looked at that a uh, couple of years ago at the on the 75th anniversary of the UN, and even their colonial modernity. Uh, and modern framings are so deeply embedded that SDGs, in some sense, if we want to tackle that problem and those sets of structures, SDGs are themselves perhaps part of the problem in some ways. Then, uh, well, we've done our best here in terms of finding the traction that we could find, bringing out these these marginalized perspectives, showing that there are pathways that are obviously neglected. Um, and then trying to direct more attention to them so far as we could in small ways, at least in the case studies. Hi, uh, my name is Yasemin. Uh, I'm doing my PhD in Sukru. Um, actually, I want to ask you, and first of all, thanks for this presentation, Tomaso and Saura. I think it is very uh, interesting to see these findings, actually. Um, I want to share one of my um, experience um, regarding the prioritization, actually, and also I want to ask you two questions. Uh, before coming here, I was working for the government, uh, the Turkish government, and actually I, I was working in the national funding uh, organization. So uh, during my job, uh, I also uh, prioritized the uh, SDI topics and uh, uh, prepared calls uh, to distribute the funding. Um, and SDG is, was one of, one of the topics actually we discussed, but I should say that, uh, for example, the capacity of the country or capability or some national security related topics uh, when and also the trends in the world, uh, we you know considered all of these topics as pillars and also we look at the SDGs but I remember that when we you know you you can't you don't have money to fund all of them so you have to prioritize them and for the SDGs and um, there were two things actually the one problem or challenge is um, I think not all of them uh, needs uh, SDI to be solved or uh, maybe one of the SDG problem is more SDI oriented, can be sol solved in SDI quickly, or the others needs less uh, research, more technology, or more other policies. So at the end, actually, I can say uh, of the report, we couldn't uh, embed all of these things. And the second uh, challenge was uh, some of them are not related to the local problems and Turkey's problems. So uh, we tried to embed these things, but at the end, the national priorities, the capacities uh, were at the top. So I want to just share this uh, and also, after this, I want to ask you, you know, how do you measure this alignment? Um, you know, uh, okay, you are um, working with the papers, patents, so you are trying to uh, embed the different pillars of the science, technology, innovation. Um, but 
you know, what is the threshold? For one pillar, uh, one paper, is it matched? Or five uh, paper, you know, what is the, how do you say there is an alignment or misalignment? Because the thresholds should be different for each uh, these SDG goals and who decide this. So, and the second one uh, relied, related to um, least development countries. So you found that uh, there is a more um, misalignment for these countries, but again, um, are they directly related to these local uh, priorities or is it the same with the global ones? If this is the case, if there is a research on the global level, then that's, um, is it enough, you know, you don't need to repeat these research. Uh, maybe you should focus on how to transfer this knowledge and the transfer some technology maybe to solve it, uh, not by funding, but maybe by using um, demand side policies like public procurement, et cetera. So uh, what do you think about this issue also? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tomaso and Saurabh. Um, it was a great pleasure uh, listening to the presentation uh, by uh, fellow SPRU colleagues, and I felt uh, really great uh, being part of this. Uh, so uh, my question's more around the, the limitations of the data collection methods, because, uh, you know, um, and, and I see I, I could foresee a lot of limitations i'm sure you you would have come across because i myself work on you know place based uh, you know uh, business models and you know the literature around that and i struggle a lot uh, finding the right kind of literature so um, uh, so some of my questions are that the first one uh, how uh, how what was basically the search criteria uh, when you were looking for research papers done on LMICs or LICs, because uh, were you using English words? Uh, because probably a lot of, I mean, a lot of research might not be published in English. Uh, the other thing is that um, a lot of grassroots level organizations working in these countries, they don't have access while they are doing great research but in the academic terms of research, good research, they may not be doing the work that journals want to see because journals, most journals are not interested in, you know, looking at very detailed grassroots based case studies and, you know, the insights coming from there. So, um, so, so how, how, so, so the, the questions, are we doing justice to the way we want to, study uh, you know where the research focus is and whether it is going in the right direction or not and um, mm, yeah i mean mostly that thank you Um, how did participating scientists conceive of themselves and their work? And to what extent did they envision their work position as directly political or development orientated? Uh, was like a third one. Um, Okay, let me, I think, thanks, thanks guys. I think a very, very interesting um, experience. And I think also address a little bit the question before about uh, power and decision-making. Um, so yeah, point taken, it's very, it's very useful to have these insights and, uh, and to talk to people who are actually behind um, making decisions. Um, now on the two uh, specific questions, um on the measure of alignment so we 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 normalize all these data of course um so we 
with, I, I think you're talking about you're referring to the regional misalignment, right? When you look at the specialization of research in different countries and, and the main SDG challenges. So the main SDG, SDG challenges are uh, taken by the SDG data, the SACS data. So just you know what what we have the kind of information we have in the different targets and aggregated to see which are the uh, main uh, challenges there and we put them in relation to different countries so you say which are the countries the countries which are doing best on on a given challenge which are almost at the at the top of addressing basically have addressed the, the sdg have reached the sdg according to the measurement of the targets this is the uh target that that would be the where all other countries would uh, uh, aim for and and then we do the opposite for the countries that uh, have the lowest level for each SDG so which uh, you know, have the highest challenge so we have a range between minus one and one for the challenges and then we compute specialization so we're not looking at number of papers but we're looking at ratios we're looking at our countries specialized are, are they doing more research relative than the world average in particular areas which are related to that SDG. So we're looking at countries specializing on where they have the strongest challenges. Yeah, but also that's a measure between zero and one for the specialization. Um, on the question about uh, whether uh, Norwegian countries should do more research rather than um, you know, uh, transferring research, uh, yeah, there's lots of debate. Um, my own um, perception, my own understanding is that um, in, you need to develop your own capabilities, you need to address your own issues, you need to uh, uh, use the information and the knowledge that you have in order to address these issues. And just buying, transferring from other countries is problematic, is part of the problem. Particularly, is part of the problem where most of, most of the research in uh, high income countries, as we're seeing, is not related to the to the SDGs, but in low income countries, it is. So, which kind of research um, and and knowledge should be transferred? So, my um, response to that would be that no, I think you should you should develop um, knowledge, capabilities, research in context and not just transfer it um also because of the diversity of this, uh, this research um on the um your questions about the 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 i think data limitations here are very well uh, spot on um i think here we're capturing the research which is published in uh, academic, basically in academic journals, and particularly here we're using the web, where the web of science, which is an even more restricted uh, source of uh, of information, uh, which is you know it's not even all the journals, it's just some of the journals. So that was my last point. We're basically looking at where the light is, but we're not looking at where the problem is. So we're using the data which is which were easily available in, in the project, but there is a huge investment, I think, in making uh, in, in capturing this information, which we currently do not capture. Um, we do in, in other research, we do show that um, using this type of research, uh, such as focus, sorry, these repositories, such as focusing, for example, on the, on the web of science, can give at the at the um, local level, at the micro level, can be a very different picture about what a specific country is uh, is doing. So yeah, I think I think that point is absolutely well taken. Um, going with with Andy, even using this problematic data you see massive problems uh, so i think if you go to to using better data you would see that i think in low income countries you would have even more research which is much more aligned to local issues than you have in, in in high income countries because we know we capture lots of the high income countries and that's very much misaligned even in the web of science low income countries is much more related to the SDGs. So if you capture better information, it would be, I think, even better picture uh, and even more difference. 
but this is something that we we miss out and, and is very problematic and and it's a, it's a i think a huge area for policy uh, intervention um and uh, sorry gary can you please repeat the the question online the, 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 the scientists themselves thought they were being political or addressing development challenges um I'm afraid we didn't. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks. Sir. I'm afraid we didn't gather that information. Um, we didn't ask about that. We what what we do see is that um, again most of the researchers, sorry, most of the people who answered to our survey were researchers themselves, and uh, they indicated directions for research which are very different from what they do. It seems. Because the, most of these researchers were working on specific issues. There are, you know, uh, researchers in, 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 in climate, researchers in energy, researchers in water, researchers in, on poverty. But then when they're asked about which might be the, the, the uh, main areas for um, science and technology innovation to address the SDGs, their main responses were policy innovations uh, or changes in the, in the uh, our framing of, uh, of what development is. So, but we don't know why the answer is that way. But in some sense, they are addressing political issues. Scientists are uh, addressed that maybe they don't think of themselves as political, but they're addressing in the well, survey political right. issues. They're asking us to focus on policy innovation. They're asking us to focus on values and directions of research. So, yeah. so it's not like they are completely devoid of politics in their lives or in their views. So that's important as, uh, from the survey. Uh, may I quickly say something to Kanika's question? So Kanika, yes, but you know that's why we also have the case studies because these databases come with their limitations. So in the case studies, we did did try our best to to address those neglected ways of knowing, those knowledges that you're talking about, grassroots innovations, etc. Um, but obviously, they, we did not we were not able to go far enough, and it's never really far enough in a in a world where there are 7,000 languages, you know, and you have one language here, English, uh, that we are mapping in a web of science, so, you know, how can you go far enough? So obviously we can't, but what is important here from my perspective is that web of science and PathStar, the two databases that were relied upon are dominant databases. They reflect the dominant directions of science technology in the world. And what we find then is that what is currently dominant is deeply mis misaligned with the SDGs. I think that's an important result that needs to be paid attention to. Yeah. Okay, finish with this thoughts. That was quite good. Okay, so we are on time, so we don't have any more comments. So we can finish. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you. And as well, and every everyone, and we can finish now. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Yeah.